Welcome to The Shooting Show. This week we follow Chris Dalton on a roebuck hunt in southwest Scotland. Right, well we're, we're up at Kinaid, actually we've been stalking, they actually rode deer a rut and we've called deer in this morning for the first time so they're really getting going so we've got clients to take out Shaz and I are here um, this afternoon but I've just put the uh, I've put the my original Swarovski scope actually on the new rifle which is the 8B56, I've had it for years, it's a lovely scope, I mean it's a bit bashed around but still does the job fixed but I just like that combination, unfortunately Swarovski don't make these particular types of scope anymore, they're all into variables and for the type of stalking we do you would never use a variable scope so i think it's a pity in many respects but anyway it's a cracking scope so that's been put on and what i've done is i've i've bore sighted it so hopefully it should be somewhere in the area of the target so we're going to kind of put a, f a few shots through just to just to adjust it really and bring it in i like to zero an inch high at 100 always done it that way and that way basically when we're shooting deer with clients at any range from you know 50 meters to, to essentially around about 200 meters they don't need to worry about holdover they put the crosshairs on the target the rifle will do the job um, we don't shoot at ranges above that the average range of a shot in a woodland environment is probably 70 yards and maybe a bit a bit further on the hill perhaps we're shooting 100 120 maybe pushing out a bit further on on stags and hinds so that's how we set the rifle up We've roughly both sighted that up, we think it's in the right area, so we're just going to put a couple of shots through initially on the target, see if we're on the paper first of all, if we're on the paper then we can fine tune and adjust accordingly. Not the most comfortable of positions. Must be getting old. Let's put another one into there. We'll see what we've got. There are two shots on that target, one's kind of on the black just near the 10 and one's quite off to the right. That was actually when we were zeroing with a client the other day or just checking his rifle. But the three shots that I've just fired now, the top kind of triangle, um, it needs adjusting slightly left. It's just slightly right of centre, which I think you can see. Uh, nice tight grouping, two of them are touching, so I'm happy with that. And I'll probably bring it down a few clicks. So my actual point of impact then will become 12 o'clock position above the black. I'm probably an inch just over an inch high so we'll let the rifle cool make a slight adjustment and then check it again a couple of shots and then we're, we're all good to go into the field with it so Matt, this is just one thing i would have mentioned the boots the, these new Ariat boots absolutely fantastic straight out of the box i've had three days on the hill with these now up there um, stoking both reds and row really comfortable don't need any wearing it at all and they're, they're surprisingly a big boot you think they're going to be heavy but they're not they're very light so extremely comfortable we've had a very very wet morning as well it was rained overnight and we were out in the, the the peat hags and the moss had all taken a lot of moisture up but dry as a bone so um, they're a bit dirtier than when you saw them the other day well not too bad i suppose we've been washed off but yeah good boots i'm pleased with those so we'll see how they go over the next few months Freshened up from the 
last few days, so it's not really what you would say, good rutting weather, but we're going to have a look anyway. There's actually been some reds in the barley field up at the back of me, so I just want to have a look at that as well. Um, I don't want to get a big lot of reds in there, they're going to start causing a lot of trouble, so if there are, then we might shoot a, a young stag just to try and deter the group, but we'll go up and see what we've got. The whole plan this morning really was we'd, we'd, we'd sort of earmarked a stalk, you know, with Shaz out sort of either side of clients really basically for a day to day. And we thought 1st of August, yeah, they're going to be rutting so we could do a bit of calling and try and call a roebuck in on film. Um, but best made plans and all the rest of it just not happening. I mean, the row here have not rutted yet. Uh, it, we've, we've had a period of three or four kind of coldish, very windy. Uh, days where the temperatures dramatically dropped from the kind of 30 degrees we've had for about three months before it so it's really kind of changed it and I think it's just slowed them, stopped them. They will start soon and you could see this morning there was no um, evidence of any activity and to be honest with you I haven't even got the call out of my pocket there's no point I mean people will be going around peeping and whistling in all the woods and all they're doing is educating the deer. So Book's dropped on the spot, you've probably seen all that, I think Shaz got it on camera. So we'll, uh, we'll go down and have a look. Nice book actually. Um, there's two or three nice ones in this area, but time for one or two of them to go. I've definitely not shown any sign of rutting yet, um, which is probably partly due to the weather, because it's come real kind of cold and fresh, and they can't be far off kicking off. They generally start about now here, usually we start first few days in August and that's where we are now and the intention was maybe to try a bit of calling this morning but there's no point in weather like this and they're not interested anyway so we'll go and see what we've got nice little six point buck there summer coat good condition Zosh starting to clean him up a bit Yeah, good animal. They're all in good nick round here though. It's super feed. Never felt anything about that. Very good condition. Yeah, it's been up to, uh, you know, that's a fence injury or a little bit of attention from another book. Probably fence looking at that. Very few ticks on him. They're all in good condition this year. I'll take that. Good order. Right, so we'll get him nicely gralloped up and then 
not too far to go home. We've got a nice uh, line of hawthorn trees over there, there'll be a nice lateral branch so we'll do a suspended growth on him. One of the things we're doing at the minute is we're uh, just sort of working with the uh, NHS, uh, doing a survey on ticks and the diseases they may carry. It's high profile at the moment, Lyme's disease and various other sort of diseases you can catch from parasites, in particular looking at ticks. So what we're actually doing is we're, we're taking a, a fresh sample of blood from the deer uh, and then also getting a tick from it and the file and the, the blood are uniquely serial numbered. Then we send in a little data sheet through with sort of condition of deer where it was shot, sex species, etc. Uh, and sending it off to the uh, down of Portland Down who are working on this survey and obviously they're checking the tick against any diseases in the in the blood of the deer. So that's one sample that will be going down from, from this lad. Um, sort of thinking more on towards the kind of level two aspect of stalking. An awful lot of people are coming to us for level two now. Is the first thing you're doing really before you start even putting a knife on the deer is, is checking the general condition so we're looking at the, the clothes of the hooves, coat condition, reaction to shot obviously was good, um, lumps and bumps or anything like that. I mean oh, clearly you don't need to be a, an expert to see this is a, a deer in fantastic condition so I'm not anticipating any problems whatsoever when we get to the growlock which is the second part next phase if you like of the, of the assessment. Uh, need to get him growl up fairly quickly. I mean, it's not too warm today actually, it's quite fresh, quite clean, it's nice, the midges are not about. We've just come out of a real hot spell like everybody has for weeks and weeks and weeks and first rain I think we had two days ago and it's really freshened it up. That's coincided with the peak of what, well, coming into the rut, so that's kind of just knocked him back a little bit I think. They'll not be long as they're at it. A lot of people still struggle with this. Um, you kind of see the main, main joint there and then just down below it is a secondary, it's kind of almost a secondary joint and if you put the knife on that and then just take the fur off, not putting any pressure on and then just kind of, you know I see people dragging and grunting and it's such, it's hard work and it's not, it's, it's so easy. So we hop the deer, you have a look at that while we're there, nice and clean grass seeds on the bottom of there. I always take the back legs off when I'm going to suspend a growlick, it just stops them tangling. So basically you can see the if you like the main knee joint there and then just down below it you can feel like a little secondary joint there put the knife on that and it's so easy so easy people really struggle with it basically for suspending it get get control of the carcass get the first hook on and then the pressure's off you can just kind of manipulate the tree a bit so you've got room to work and you can move it around then as you need. And basically a bit of upward pressure and all I'm doing is skinning that back. Same if it's female with the udder. A little bit sparing use of the knife. Upward pressure. Upward pressure and then I can kind of more or less push that out the way. So I've gone right back with that and push that back out of the way. So you can now see it's nice and neat, nice and clean. So what I'm going to do now is a nice neat cut down to the H-bone. Don't faff about with it, cut it. And that's now exposed the line of my cut for the bone saw. So the bone saw is going to go flat on there. Now there's a couple of ways you can do it. A lot, some people struggle to hold the, the stomach in if I go any further. Um, to get that sort of flat cut. Follow that right down to the bleed hole. So again, you're exposing the breastbone. That's going to be another cut for the bone saw. So the two cuts for the bone saw will be to the top of the sternum to open the chest cavity, rib cage, then everything will want to fall out. The only thing holding it in will be kind of, if you like, the, the, the diaphragm skirt. All the intestines, the, the guts in here, which we'll need to examine. And what we'll do is we'll open up that bone there, the H bone. Spread the legs as wide as you can so you've got a nice gap there and then basically feed the anus through and then just nick it off at the back. We'll nick, we'll nick this down, down to the top here. Watch my fingers on this, I don't want to puncture the, the rumen at all. And then just to the top of the, top of the breastbone there. I'm going to bring the knife out now onto the top of that. And then I'm just going to ease down 
just just ease it down to there okay now just make that line of that cut more obvious and what I'll do is the next phase I'll do is before I go to the anus so what I'm going to do now is open up the chest cavity and that's a slashing cut that'll release more of the blood again assist with the cooling make sure you, you go right through the bottom of the rib cage which I have done and now I can let that go it's a flat cut now on the pelvic bone H bone and you just start to hear that going through And there we go okay finished with that now so basically what I've got now is a is little gap ideally still if we can we want that a bit wider that's better now you can see that channel that's where this slot comes out so a lot of this is done without the knife I put my finger in so watch that lovely knife and free it off, same on the other side free it off it's only tissue ok and then I can now put my hand around the back of here freeze all that forward now, now this again is upward pressure, just ease it out of any jagged bones if you need to help it knife in just to the side a little bit lift it up and lift it up, now look how clean is that now so all I've got to do now to release this and basically grab the steer is free the diaphragm skirt off. You can see the diaphragm skirt there. Okay, just go around. It's easy. Finger through so I can see I don't want to be cutting anything. No, I don't want to be cutting the finger, so be careful. Knife in then work this way. That's freed it off. Same on this side. Fingers in close to the diaphragm, close to the rib cage. the only thing holding this in now is all this connective tissue in the middle okay so that is, yeah, is good. that's just caught in the rib cage there, it's not a drama that is basically after Gralocadia deer myself but there's a limit to how much venison you can eat so obviously there's a fair bit of it goes into the into the dealer basically my details species sex any particular problems with a beast or anything like that so that's all ready to go in so we'll pop that inside I think and then that uh, it's quite cool actually that now so I think we pop that straight in the chiller Chris relying on some canine assistance there. And now, it's the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News. Hunters and shooters are still being targeted for online abuse. A new survey has revealed that 62% of country sports fans had received bullying or harassment online. Respondents to the Countryside Alliance survey said people had had death threats against them, their children's pictures posted online and emails to their employers to try and lose them their jobs. An Alliance spokesperson said that the impact this kind of abuse has on individuals cannot be underestimated. The countdown to the shooting events at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics has begun. British Shooting released its selection policy for Olympic shooters this week. Each athlete has to achieve a minimum qualifying score, then it's down to the selection panel's judgement. And the first quota places for the shooting events are being handed out at the World Championships, which begin on Thursday. It's the first real step on the road to Tokyo. Is grouse shooting sustainable? That's the topic of the first entry in Bast's new blog, Offbeat. 
In it, Colin Shedden says it looks likely there will be only a little driven and walked up grouse shooting this year, but that most moors will continue with the vital habitat management and pest control that is required to give stocks a chance to recover, even without sporting income. He called on shoots to put on some walked up shooting to increase participation, even though it can't replace driven shooting. Read the blog at basque.org.uk slash offbeat. And finally, with the nights getting longer, don't miss the September issue of Sporting Rifle magazine. It's a fox shooting special with expertise from all the biggest names in the foxing world on how to make the most of prime lamping season. Plus there are tips on how to get the most out of night vision and a roundup of NV units that won't break the bank. And there's late season buck stalking, a Remington rifle review and sport abroad besides. Pick up Sporting Rifle in any good news agents or subscribe at myfavouritemagazines.co.uk. That was the Shooting Show News. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you're not a member of Basque, it's time to join now. Basque, looking after your sport, looking after you. This has been The Shooting Show.